Ever since Darwin, biologists have understood the importance of the tree of life metaphor. In Philomath, we will learn how to infer that tree and how to use it to understand biological processes. Philomath is made possible through a career grant from NSF, as well as ongoing support from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. All right, so today we're going to learn about some of the key ways to read a tree to understand a tree. Right? So learn what a tree means, learn some of the jargon you need to talk to people about, about trees, and learn to instinctively cringe when you hear certain parts of jargon, like basal taxon. All right, here's a diagram from Hennig showing what a tree represents. Right? And at the bottom you have the actual population history. Right? So you see males and females having offspring, and the offspring spread, and then at some point something like a mountain range pops up, and suddenly they can't breed anymore, and so now we have two different populations, right? B and C. Now you could argue about whether you know A is actually the same as B, and so it should be A and A and A and C, or if they create two new things, B and C. Um, for people working in neontology, so work on modern thing, modern organisms. We don't often think about this. For paleontologists, though, it matters. You try to say you find like B and C, B and A in the fossil record, okay? But typically, we just represent this as A becoming B and C at that time point when the triangle appears, okay? The important way to think about trees is a series of nestings, right? So in two, we have a phylogeny. Now, if you go up and look down at it, we see that series of nestings there, right? So for example, that group two, right? Um, includes other groups within it, so group three and group four, okay? And everything in group four is more closely related to things, other things in group four than they are to anything in group three. Anything in group three is more closely related to anything else in group three than is anything um, outside of group three, and so on, right? So we have this understanding of these nested groups that share this history, okay? And that's basically what a tree is. Now it's important to realize, rec recognize how much biology we're losing when we go to this tree metaphor. Right? I mean, Darwin at one point thought of talking about the coral of life, right? this branching, reticulating structure, and then went to the tree of life metaphor. Um, but we know in reality, of course, stuff exchanging genes all over the place. Right? And so we think about what the actual history of populations is. There's hybridization, there's introgression, there's population subdivision that comes back together. Speciation events can take a long time. So you have a gradual reduction in gene flow rather than a single instantaneous switch. Um, many factors can play a role in evolution, right? But then we just choose to summarize that as a single tree. Now, um, we are working on, you know, the field's working on methods to deal with more articulation, more of this net-like structure of trees, of, of, of populations rather than a full tree structure. That said, most of the field still relies on this tree metaphor and methods only accept trees. Okay, so you'd be stuck with trees for 20 years more. So the term for this structure, I've been saying tree a lot. We also call it a phylogeny, this phylomath, a cladogram if no branch lengths, also for mathematicians, a connected graph with no cycles. This is a taxon, also known as an OTE, or operational taxon unit, also known as a leaf, also known as a terminal, also known as a terminal node. Um, taxa are often extant organisms, but they don't have to be. So you can have fossils as taxa, you can have flu viruses for the past 20 years as taxa, um, and so you, you don't have to, you can't just assume that all taxa occur at the same time. Okay. A branch on the tree is also known as an edge. You hear me use both in this course. It might have length, and that corresponds to time, amount of character change, or probability of character change. Right, so just looking at a tree, can you tell what that is? No. And sometimes the, the branch, it has a branch length. That doesn't mean anything other than what will look good you know, to draw. Um, so you have to often read a paper to figure out what the branch lengths mean. We have an internal node. Okay. So node is where different edges meet. Okay. Um, if all just have two descendant branches, or say if all nodes have degree three, the tree is bifurcating or fully resolved or dichotomous. Nodes with more branches are polytomies or multicotomies, right? Now, you often assume that the true history has one species becoming two, not one species becoming three, right? Um, if it becomes three, I think it happened, you know, one split and then shortly after another split, okay? Um, and yet we often see on actual trees, we'll draw them as one node leading to many descendants, right? And what that represents is uncertainty. So we think there's some ordering of the splitting, but we don't know what it is, and so we summarize that on a visualization by collapsing that to a polytomy. Okay. 
So often most polytomies we call those soft polytomies, where they represent lack of information. If it actually represents you know, an actual case where we, went, where we had one species instantly is becoming three, then it's actually called a hard polytomy. Okay? The difference is with the soft polytomy, as you add more data, we hope to resolve that into a bifurcating structure. With a hard polytomy, we believe that no matter how much data you throw at it, you will never know, know the branching other than that instantaneous branching into multiple. The root is also a node. Okay. Um, a rooted tree is the one you'll see most commonly, and it has a node that represents the most recent common ancestor, MRCA or LCA, least common ancestor, Volotaxa. A rooted tree, also known as a directed graph or digraph, shows the direction of time. Okay. Now note that this root is often is not actually an organism we sample. Um, we might have an out group, so something related to everything else, but definitely outside that group that helps us root it, but the root is actually just an internal node. Okay, why does rooting matter? Here we have a paper by Brady et al. Um, and they have a phylogeny of ants, and they had different placements for possible roots. Okay, so where are the ants, where does the ant tree connect to the, neck, the rest of the tree of life? Okay, so on the left is an unrooted tree, and the right are various rooted trees. And so this can affect our, our conclusion about evolutionary history. So with rooting one, um, if we do associate reconstruction, we, re we reconstruct that the ancestor of modern, of modern ants was living in small colonies, and then a few later evolved big colonies, right? Whereas if we um, reverse that and have a different, have a different rooting, it implies that ants were in bigger colonies earlier on, and then some of them evolved to smaller colonies, right? So the direction of the change of this trait, um, our, infer our conclusion about that is based on this rooting. Okay, so rooting could definitely matter for that case. Okay. I've mentioned clade a few times, and we'll see clades throughout the course. A clade is just an ancestor and all its descendants, a monophyletic group. Okay? You want to hear people talk about these as natural groups, right? So like primates, right? They're a natural group. And why do we like naming clades? Well, clade tells us they share all their history up to where they branch. Okay? So if I say mammal, you know, okay, they have the they have hair or fur, they produce milk, they're uh, they have four limbs. Um, they have eyes, right? And you know, some later lose those traits, right? Um, they still have shared that history in the past, okay? And so it's a natural way. And so you can predict some new traits. If we find some new brain structure, right? We can say, okay, we find that brain structure in a walrus. I bet we're all going to see the same structure in whales rather than in iguanas, right? Because whales share much more history with them than iguanas do, okay? So it helps us organize life, helps us make predictions about life. And so here's a clade, that pink group. Here's also a clade. Here's a clade. And here's a clade. And note that these two clades have the same terminal taxa in them, right, but different ancestors. Okay? They're still both clades. A paraphyletic group is an ancestor but some, and some but not all of us descendants. Right? So I said, you know, this group minus that orange one with gray eyes, right, that's a paraphyletic group. Okay, and we used to see these a lot in taxonomy, right? So if you think about dinosaurs and then birds are something different, well, if you know now that birds are evolved from within other dinosaurs, right? So dinosaurs including birds is a clade. Dinosaurs excluding birds is a paraphyletic group, okay? Um, if we think of, you know, animals and then humans not being animals, or great apes and humans not being great apes, those are paraphyletic groups, right? Humans are clearly nested within those groups. Right, um, and so we try to avoid those terms. Now, a polyphyletic group is even worse. It's you know some taxa that may not even share a common ancestor. Okay, now of course you could go back far enough. You know, all taxa share a common ancestor, and so the distinction between polyphyletic and paraphyletic sort of depends on how you paint the branches internally, whether they're in that group or outside of that group. Okay, so in this course, I'm not going to make a big distinction. In the past, it mattered more because there were some arguments that we could name paraphyletic groups, but not polyphyletic groups. Um, but now it's sort of gone by the wayside. We now only name clades. Okay. Um, we can also like to compare um, equal groups of the tree, right? So here we have the red and blue branches. Are the red part of the tree is sister to the blue part of the tree? Is the term we have. Um, and so they share a common ancestor, so red plus blue is a clade, and then there was a speciation event, and the blue evolved on their own, and the red evolved on their own. Okay? Um, and there's many such sister groups on this tree. So here's another sister group pair. 
right? So we say the fly on the left is sister to the fly on the right, okay? Um, and these are important for comparing things. Since they, have, since they have the same history up to that branching point, we can use them like we could use a twin study, right? So you could have a bunch of twins, identical twins, and you know start giving some cigarettes at age three and some not, and then see how they change, right? And everything else is the same for them except for cigarette smoking. Right? So we can do the same thing on the tree. And we'll talk about that more when we get into comparative methods. Okay, But right now, the term to learn is sister group. So for your tax on interest, the clade that, that shares a common interest with it and goes its own way. Okay. And here's another sister group. So sister groups don't have the same, have the same diversity. Right? So we have two, two taxa on one side, one taxon on the other side. Okay. Some jargon about characters. So homology is similarity due to shared ancestry. So humans, birds, and turtles all have four limbs. So there's a homologous trait for us, right? Now it's also homoplasy. So again, similarity, but not due to shared ancestry, right? So dolphins and ichthyosaurs have a similar shape, even though they have very, very different ancestors, right? Because of convergence towards, you know, being able to swim quickly through the water while breathing air and hunting fish. Um, or other marine vertebrate, marine animals, right? <coughs> there are differences. I mean, dolphin tails move up and down, ichthyosaurs move left to right, right? Um, but they have this overall convergence, and so you call that homoplasy. Now, for inferring a tree, you want to use homologous traits, right? So dolphins should be grouped with other mammals due to having, you know, hair and warm blood and live birth and um, producing milk and so forth. Right, rather than grouped with ichthyosaurs due to dorsal fin, swimming, um, nostrils m m moving towards the top of the head, and so forth. Right, so you want homologous traits to give us the true history. Right, homoplasy traits though are interesting in showing us convergence, and evolutionarily they're very important. Okay, characters. Um, we will talk about character as a plesiomorphy, so ancestral. We used to say primitive, but avoid that now. Um, character state with reference to another derived state. Right. Uh, Symplesiomorphy is a plesiomorphy shared by two or more taxa. Okay, an apomorphy is a derived or advanced character state with reference to another ancestral state, and synapomorphy is shared by two or more taxa. Okay, and odd apomorphy is just produced by one taxon. Okay, so for plesiomorphy, example is sharks living in the water compared to tetrapods that are living on land, right? So the ancestor of sharks and, and tetrapods lives in the water, right? Um, but tetrapods evolved to live on land. And so uh, in this case, living in the water was the ancestral trait. So it's the plesiomorphy, right? Um, whales living in water relative to tetrapods living on land is now a derived trait, right? So still living in water, right? But here the evolutionary context is evolving from terrestrial to aquatic, right? So that direction tells us it's an apomorphy, okay? Um, apomorphies help tell us evolutionary history, right? Um, they help identify clades. Okay, one thing to note is correct plural here. So two taxa, one taxon. People often make that mistake. Another bit of jargon that um, can hang people up is talking about advanced and primitive or basal taxa. So when you talk about evolution to students, we often talk about this sort of great chain of being notion of this continual increase in complexity. If you read your intro bio textbook, look at the ordering of the chapters, right? The chapter on humans is at the end, um, and chapters on simpler things like protists are often earlier on, right? So you have this increase in complexity. And we draw trees, we draw them in this way. So this is a tree, uh, this is a pectinate tree, so comb-like tree, sort of like you've seen a, a scarab beetles and tenny, antennal clubs like that. Um, <coughs> And so people often talk about that taxon that branches off first from everything else as a basal taxon, okay? And the problem with that is it implies that um, the, that taxon is somehow, you know, less less evolved than the others. And now we're looking at, you know, this sort of tree, you might say, eh, well, you know, bacteria, single cells, they are pretty simple compared to Darwin, right? But I could draw a different tree, um, so, Take that tree, same same tree topology, but now different organisms on it. So I move Darwin over there, and now I have invertebrates, right? And so now Darwin might be called the basal taxon, right? And then you might say, you know, um, cockroaches are the advanced taxon, right? Doesn't quite seem right either, though. 
So you should get back to the idea of those nestings, right? I mean, the early plot I showed you by Hennig that show these series of nestings, those nestings didn't have like, you know, this nesting of the clade on the right, you know, wasn't any more advanced further from the root than the one on the left. They've all been evolving for the same amount of time, right? So oftentimes we should try to avoid saying things like basal taxa and just talk about the tree. Um, there's nothing special about Darwin on this tree. He's sister to everything else, so you could say that. Um, but calling it advanced or primitive or basal tends to imply things about evolutionary history that haven't been shown by the tree topology. You could test for that. You could test to see how many changes in the branch leading to Darwin, how many changes in the branch leading to cockroaches, and see if there's more changes in one than the other. Um, but it doesn't necessarily follow from the tree topology. So what you have picked up from today is some of the jargon, clade, monophyletic, taxon, paraphyletic, and so forth, and learning how to avoid primitive thinking in terms. Thank you.